wars and rumors of wars, uh, or is this the end of the world? You might look at the list kid, you think it might be the end of the world. This is basically me at an early age having a tantrum. And I would hold my breath, turn blue, fall on the ground. This kept my parents from going out. They finally figured what to do. My dad went to the refrigerator, got some cold water, poured it on my head. Stop that. We lived in Chicago in a small apartment in the early 50s. And believe it or not, milkmen would come to your front door and bring you milk every day. Uh, my brother and I heard about something called strawberry milk and thought it would be a good idea. Asked my mother, she said, no, there's no such thing as strawberry milk. Next day we asked the milkman, he brought it. It taught me my mother didn't know everything. My mother grew up in this town, in Illinois, in a town of 5,000 people. They've had 5,000 people in that town since the 1800s. It's not a fast-growing town. But we would go there in the summers, and I discovered at that house a book that she had, a 1934 edition of Believe It or Not. In Russia, they call it Believe It or Else. But uh, this book really excited me about the amazing things that you could learn in the world. And it wasn't stuff that you saw in school, like this guy could swallow his nose, and there are two-headed calves. It was unbelievable. As I continued in my education of weird things, Wrinkle in Time, maybe people have read Wrinkle in Time. It's a wonderful book, Stranger Than Science. Stranger Than Science has actually documented cases of huge chunks of ice falling out of the sky. Uh, they don't know how it happens. There's, there's things in there you would never imagine. The elementary school I went to when we moved to Florida, Pinecrest Elementary, very uh, normal kind of a place. Me and my three brothers went there from kindergarten all through sixth grade in the same school, open air school. Our principal would read a bilingual menu every day, papas, fritas, leche con, whatever. And uh, this was the path to our school. You would ride a bike every day, it takes about uh, nine minutes, and we tried to do other pathways to get home quicker. And I'll tell you why we wanted to get home quicker in a minute. But that's the path, and we could go different pathways to the school. We did a school play in elementary school where we reenacted Nikita Khrushchev's 1960s speech to the United Nations where he said, he took off his shoe, pounded on the table, and he said, we will bury you. I mean, we reenacted this. I was the United Nations guy, Howard Michelson was Khrushchev, and Jeffrey Morris acted the part of uh, Castro. Growing up in Miami, we're basically 90 miles Key West from Cuba. The reconnaissance aircraft in 1962 showed that there were missile bases on the north coast of Cuba pointed at us. My dad thought, boy, what are we going to do? He had a friend, Mr. Harrison, who was an heir to a big international construction company and had a hobby of refitting ancient cars, and he would drive them over to our houses on Sunday. He also had a zip line in his backyard, a very creative inventor kind of a person. And Mr. Harrison actually had a history of being in the South Pacific when they did the above ground nuclear testing after World War II. This is one of the things that he witnessed. And in some of those testings, the wind shifted, and the radioactive fallout went where you wouldn't think it was going to go. And Mr. Harrison had longtime skin condition that required him to take cortisone for his entire life. And toward the end of his life, his bones were settled down. This is our backyard where Mr. Harrison put in a bomb shelter. He put one in his own yard, too, because he realized the government could not protect you from an atomic bomb. So what are you going to do? Build a bomb shelter. We had a bomb shelter, and this bomb shelter was 10 foot underground, 4 foot poured cement, radioactive filters, multi-purpose food for six weeks, a marine toilet, a pitcher pump we had our own well, and cans of multi-purpose food, one giant battery, a small light, and a book that said you can survive the bomb. And we were planning to go down to there, and we would ride our bikes home from school very fast, get into the bomb shelter. This was a reality for us. We weren't going to hide under our desks like the other students. We were going to be riding home quickly, get in that bomb shelter. Later, I went off to Boulder, Colorado for college and got interested in these kinds of ideas. Gandhi's experiments with truth, autobiography, yogi, and these talked about nonviolent approaches to peace in the world, because I realized that unless there's peace in the world, anything you can do in life is just going to be a waste of time. It's like making the deck chairs on the Titanic. What's the deal? These are a couple additional books, Rampa, Carlos Castaneda. These people looked into inner space of the human experience 
and how to experience deeper levels. And this came out in the Scientific America article in 1972 showing that transcendental meditation actually had physiological measurements that showed the blood pressure went down, heart rate went down, and created some brain waves that were coherent. And these were not moods, but these were actual events. This is a demographic called the doomsday clock. I don't know if you know about the doomsday clock, but if you look at the bottom there, you can see around 1984 and also back of the Cuban Missile Crisis and toward the end of the World War II. This shows how close we are to midnight for the whole country, the whole world blowing up. This is a thing that became unclassified or declassified last year. It shows that in 1983-84, called the Winter of Crisis, the United States was doing war exercises in Europe. The Soviet Union was thinking, hey, these are not war exercises. They're going to attack us. So it was a very tense situation that prompted the founder of meditation, TM, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, to call to Fairfield, Iowa, in the middle of the winter, as many international peoples could come. This shows 7,000 people assembled at this golden dome in Fairfield, Iowa, doing a group practice of transcendental meditation. And I believe that had a pivotal effect in the uh, averting of that crisis in 1983-84. This brings us back to the beginning of Let It Be by the Beatles. There is inner technology that you can use, and it can affect your life, and it can affect the lives of others, and it can affect the life of the world, and I invite you to uh, participate in that. Thank you.